as we continue this series on the New Testament book, 1 Peter. We are going to see today something that is countercultural. It is not what the culture encourages, it's not what the culture leads to. It's actually rejected by the culture, seen as something that is negative. But we need to understand that God's word is right forever. God's word does not change in relevance, application, and truth. God's word is the same. But what happens is culture tries to tell us, well, that doesn't apply anymore. That's old. But see, our culture tries to redefine what God has defined. Culture tries to change what God has established because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so what we're going to read about today is not an issue of being wrong, it's the culture has made it distorted, and so we're going to see through Scripture what is truth. And we're going to go deep into this to be able to see how it applies to our lives. So over the past couple of weeks, we've looked at, through First Peter, this call to submitting to authority, which, again, is countercultural. Our culture is all about, look out for number one, which is yourself. Culture is all about how you can advance. Culture is about take care of yourself, protect yourself. That's not what we see in Scripture. And so we're going to see this leading specifically to a call for Christians to submit to one another. And again, that is not what we hear in culture, in the world today. But we need to see God's truth, his power, his purpose, his timeless, timeless truth for the church. Now, all of this is going to be focused on in two specific portions of Scripture. So, to be able to really capture the fullness of what it means to submit, to live a life of Christian submission, I felt like we needed more than just 1 Peter 3, verses 1 through 6. So, we're adding Ephesians chapter 5. So, you get a little bit of a double dose here today, all right? We're, we're going, to, going to have some, some scripture that's going to add to this so we can see the deeper meaning. Ephesians chapter 5, and I'm going to start with verse 18, because this has to be the foundation, because submission, submitting to others is not natural. It's not what our flesh or our human tendencies will lead to, because we will reject that. So, we need to understand that, first of all, as followers of Jesus, as Christians, as spiritual exiles who belong to heaven and not this world, we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. That is the only way we can please God. That's the only way that we can live countercultural. That's the only way that we can love each other by ultimately loving God above all. So Ephesians 5, 18 sets the foundation for this. Be filled with the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit leads our emotions. Because our emotions, separate from the Spirit of God, will lead the wrong direction of God. Be filled with the Spirit. Leading our emotions, our attitude, our thoughts, our actions... And being filled with the Spirit means that we let the Holy Spirit be in charge of our life, lead our life. It's not based upon us or what we want because that leaves us in the flesh. That leaves us in the natural. We, through Jesus Christ, have been called to live spiritually, which why Jesus said, I did not leave you as orphans. No, he has given us his Spirit to dwell in us. We need the Holy Spirit. The church for too long has quenched the spirit and we have tried to live in our own ability and there is no way we can do it. So, be filled with the spirit which will produce the likeness of Jesus, the character of Jesus. And the apostle Paul in Ephesians 5, going from being filled with the spirit, the only way we can live submitting one to another is through the Holy Spirit, leads us to what we see in Ephesians 5.21. This is our first point. 
a spirit-filled follower of Jesus should be a submissive person. A spirit-filled follower of Jesus should not face relationships with other Christians in conflict, should not face relationships within our home in opposition and defiance. No, a spirit-filled follower of Jesus submits one to another. Now, when both sides submit, let's say you got two people and there's some impasse, there's something, maybe, maybe they're a Kansas fan and a North Carolina fan. I don't know what it is, but maybe there's an impasse there. When we submit one to another, both are saying Jesus is in the middle of us. Okay? That's what that means. That's in a marriage, that's in a family, that's among believers. Submitting one to another a spirit-filled follower of Jesus should be a submissive person. Ephesians 5.21, he sets this overarching theme. Overarching theme. Submit to one another out of reverence of Christ. Submit to one another means you choose the other person over yourself. It's not about you. And ultimately what it means is it's about Jesus. Jesus. And I follow the example of Jesus, and Jesus laid down his life. That is love. And so we see this, again, this banner that is over this whole thing. A spirit-filled follower will be led to submit to other people for the sake of Christ. For the glory of God and for Christ to be the priority. The word submit here is hupotasso. That's a Greek compound verb, and tasso means to arrange or place in order, and hupo means under. So what is the place of order in our relationships? We need to take the place of coming under that person and lift them up, adding to them. We don't have a relationship of how can I gain out of this situation. Now that's hard when emotions are involved, right? Right? You're all jacked up on emotions and you're like, oh, it's fight time, right? But the Holy Spirit produces love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and somebody help me, self-control. That's when the Holy Spirit leads. That's when the result, the fruit, will be the character of Jesus in me and Jesus between me and that other person. This applies to everything, okay? This is for every believer. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Take a position to come under and lift them up closer to Jesus. And we see this multiple places in Scripture, but my favorite comes also from Paul's writing to the church in Philippi. Philippians 2, 1 through 2. If you're not familiar with this scripture, I really encourage you to really study this. And this is not humanly possible. We cannot do it in our own ability. This is God at work within us. I'm going to start with verses 1 through 2 and then really focus on 3 and 4. This is what Paul says. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ. So if you have an ounce of encouragement, we should have an overflowing amount of encouragement, of being united with Christ, saved by Christ, set apart in Christ. But he says, even if you have a little bit, it should lead to this. And then he goes on, if you have any comfort from his love, we should have an overwhelming flow of encouragement from his love and comfort from his love. And if you have any, just an ounce of fellowship with the Spirit, any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded. Have the same mind towards each other the same mind having the same love towards each other being one in spirit we have the same spirit don't quench the spirit allow the spirit to move and being one in purpose and then he goes on to break that down and what that looks like do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit what that is countercultural. our culture does not tell us that But God tells us that. And that's what the Spirit will produce. 
do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility. That's the key. Again, hupotasso, coming underneath, lifting up. That is what that means. In humility, consider others better than yourselves. Other translations say higher than yourself. Well, when you have that heart to submit and there's a conflict or there's to serve or to love somebody and you take that position to say, I'm going to come up underneath and lift them up, guess what? You're in that place where you're lifting them, valuing them above yourself. And then he says, each of you should look not to your only to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Now, I didn't add this, but if you read on, which I hope you do, Philippians 2, starting verse 5, says every relationship, you should have the mind of Jesus. And then he goes on to explain the mind of Jesus, who being in quality equal with God, did not want to exercise that when he came to earth, but he humbled himself, taking on our human nature, and then showed us the ultimate picture of hupotasso, or love, laying down his life. Have the mind of Jesus towards each other. That has to be the pursuit of every believer, and that's when we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us in a way we can't on our own. That, does that make sense? Does everybody get that? That is foundational. We need the Holy Spirit to produce the mind of Christ where we humble ourselves and we intentionally pursue the interest of others and come up underneath them to lift them up closer to God. That is every believer. That has to be a part of us pursuing God to produce in our life. And is that a lifelong journey? Yes. As almost 50 years old, and I know some of you are going to be shocked and go, Daryl, I thought you were 30. Thank you. I love you. Thank you. You're all my favorite. But almost 50, I learn a new measure of this every year. Because as I pursue God, it is less of me and more of Jesus. And the result will be the mind of Christ for other people. Do I mess up sometimes? Absolutely. But even that Holy Spirit that produces that will also convict me and I repent and I learn that that is, that is the character of Christ and that is having Christ in between me and others. Now, one of the biggest places this is lived out and one of the hardest places to live this out for some of you know exactly what I'm talking about, is in a marriage. And nobody said amen. I'm really surprised at that. It is hard to submit one to another within a marriage, but it is crucial for Jesus to be the center of that marriage. It is crucial. Now, this week, I start, well, I don't start. Peter does it in his book, and then Paul, in his letter, starts with the women. The wives, how they are submit to their husbands. Now, it will be a huge injustice if you men do not come back next week. Because next week is you. Please come back. If not, someone record the message, get on YouTube, send a link 50 times until they say, stop, I will watch it. Okay? Because it is so important. They have to work together. They have to work together. But Paul starts... By saying, submit one to another, and then he gives the picture of what submission looks like for the wife. Now, again, next week, we're going to look at the men. And the men, that is being like Jesus, sacrificing, laying down your life. No matter what the women are called to, men, you do not get off easy. Because a wife will feel protected. She will find that place of willingly... Respect her husband when the husband sacrifices for her. They actually flow so beautifully together. Okay? So, here we go. A spirit-filled wife should be submissive to her husband. That's countercultural. Our culture will go, foul, that's not right, that's wrong. Women equality, blah, 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 blah. This is women equality, but spiritual equality that actually is freedom. What the world offers is not freedom. Okay, this is freedom. 
This is God's design, and his design doesn't change. Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Now, that last part we'll get to, because that last part's most important. As unto the Lord. But wives, submit to your husbands. Again, hupotasso. Come underneath. Wives, come underneath your husbands and lift them up closer to God. Take a position in which you are not looking for your gain or interest. You are looking to lift your husband up closer to God. Now, some people in our culture will look at this and they'll go, oh, submission. That means that the wife is inferior. The husband is greater and the wife is less than. No, that's not what that means. Because actually in Christ, we are equal. We are equal in Christ. This, this is value language. Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female. You are all one in Christ. Now, this is not getting rid of gender like the world wants to do. No. What this is saying is the value system is equal. That in Jesus, we are all one. There is no inferiority. But actually, when you look at a wife submitting to her husband... That actually is the opposite of inferiority. It means the wife is treasured. It means she's protected and cared for. To submit does not make the wife second in the relationship. It actually makes her a priority of care. It makes her a priority of care. This is about being able to again submit to Christ who is between you. Submit to Christ so that he is in the rightful place. As a wife respects her husband and a husband sacrifices for his wife. It is a mutual submission. And it is a submission in which Jesus becomes the center of your marriage. It is a beautiful unity that only God can do. Is a beautiful unity that only God can do. Now, Paul goes on in verse 23 and says, For the husband is the head of the wife. Now, again, in a culture that is against God, in a culture that distorts and tries to redefine what God has defined, the culture will say, Well, that's offensive. The husband's the head. How dare you? Well, let me explain. I thought of this a couple years ago in this context. Let's put it in the context of the physical body. How many of you have a head? Okay, yeah, you wouldn't be here if you didn't have one. A head means you're alive, right? You have a head. You need a head, right? Well, the husband is to be the head. But how many of you have a heart? Yeah, yes, you wouldn't be here if you didn't have a heart. Both of those are essential for life. Both of those things are different. They are not the same. Is one more valuable than the other? Absolutely not. They have a different purpose. They have a different design. They both have to work together, and they both are necessary. The same in a marriage. The husband is to be the head. The wife is to be the heart. They are both equal, but they have different, different design purposes. But they have to work together. Now, I'd like to take this and look at this in, in, a, in a different level here. Genesis 2.18. We see in the very beginning that God saw that it was not good for man to be alone. Now, my kids have said, Dad, we pray that you die first. Now, it took me a while because at first I'm like, Dad, what? You want me to die? But then they're like, no, seriously, because you will be a mess sitting in a corner with Fritos on your face if mom goes first. That is true. That is true. I, please, God, be gracious and take me first because the truth is it is not good for a man to be alone. But there's a deeper meaning to this beyond Cheetos on your face. The deeper meaning comes what is said next. Where God said to Adam, the very first man, I will make a helper suitable for you. And again, the culture is like, foul play, foul play, that's offensive. That's, we're getting all of our attorneys in line. No, let's look at the meaning here. I will make a helper suitable. That word helper does not mean servant, guys. Does not mean servant. And helper does not mean of less value. 
That word, that original Hebrew word, helper, means one who completes. One who completes. Men, husbands, you are incomplete without what God does in your life. Women, you are incomplete without what God does in your husband. It is a picture of two halves that are incomplete, but when God designs it, when God sets these two apart, they become one. And not the one being they become like the husband or they become like the wife. They become a new one, and that new one is a spiritual oneness where they are incomplete without each other. Now, does that happen as soon as you get married? JB, no, it doesn't. It does not. You can talk to Jane. She was ready to jump ship after the first year. She was like, he is so immature. What happened? No, you grow into this. This is when you come to the end of yourself. This is when you hupotasso. You Love your spouse and submit to them a mutual submission. The head needs the heart. The heart needs the head. And you pursue each other by pursuing God. And you lift each other up closer to God. And the result is you see God do a completeness in that you need each other. And you need what God's doing in each of you. And the result is the man becomes a better man because of her. She becomes a better woman because of the man, but it's ultimately the better comes because God does something when there is a covenant with him and the two halves become a whole. I'm telling you, this is God's design. And don't believe what the world tells you. It is a load of baloney. It is not true. And what happens, we've got such a strong divorce rate within the church because they're following the world's design. Marriage is not easy. As we're going to see next week, it is both submitting to each other. But what is described here is that when there is that mutual submission, when there is that selfless love that lifts each other up to Christ, there is a complete work that's done. You're better than you were separate. That's truth, church. That is truth. That is truth. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, we see Peter step into this submission, and he's talking to specifically wives in situations where their husbands are not being spiritual leaders or their husbands are not believers. So he calls a submission that I think has such a unique and beautiful picture of what God can do in the life of a believer. So let's look at this. Again, this is in context where submission in a marriage specifically applies to a wife whose husband is not leading spiritually or has not become a follower of Jesus. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husbands. So that if any of them do not believe the word, that means the gospel. If they do not believe the good news of Jesus, they may be won over without words. But by the behavior of their wives, when they see the purity and reverence of their lives. That's the thing, let your actions be louder than your words. But we're going to see how that applies. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to make themselves beautiful for their submission to their husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed and called him her master. You are daughters you are her daughters if you do what is right and do not give way to fear now our culture is going to see this and go see i told you this apostle that you believe was a follower of jesus the culture is going to say he's telling women that they can't have braided hair they can't wear jewelry or have fine clothes and they're going to say see that's control and then they call their husband master this is wrong okay 
Again, we cannot let the world define what God defines. Let me explain what all this means. A wife's submission to her husband is ultimately to help her husband see God in her character. To see God in her character, in her purity, in her fear of God. Again, hupotasso, coming up underneath and lifting him up closer to God. We see that consistent message from Peter in chapter 2, verse 12. Live such good lives among pagans or unbelievers that they may see your good deeds. Live your life in such a way that they can't help but see God and glorify God. That is the heart of submission. It's when we lower ourselves to lift others up closer to God. And this is the result of a wife's life that is ultimately submitted to God. Now, what's this mean with the braided hair and jewelry and all that? Peter is not saying that women can't have nice clothes, braided hair, or jewelry. What he's saying is, is women, to submit yourselves to your husband and ultimately to Jesus Christ means that you are pursuing an inner beauty above any pursuit of outward beauty. You are pursuing an inner beauty that comes from a pursuit of God. An inner beauty that comes from a filling of the Spirit in which you look more like Jesus in your life and in your choices and in your attitude. And the result of that will be that your husband will be drawn to God. So don't pursue all of this outward adornment of beauty that is empty. Those things are okay if you do that. As long as you're pursuing the greater beauty, which is Jesus on the throne of your heart. That's what he's saying here. Submit to your husband in that you show them Jesus. And submit ultimately to the king of your heart, Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about. And our culture wants to twist that all around. Poo-poo on the culture. Quote me on that. Poo-poo on the culture. Because God's word is the same. God never changes. And God's truth is relevant today. And I'm telling you, when we live this out, our lives, our lives will look different from the world, but we will have the move of God. We won't have an absence of trials or hardship but we will have the strength, the hope, the peace of Christ through those hardships and trials. And you will see God move in your families. And we will see a church that is on fire and ready to live out our faith in a powerful way because we stop tripping over ourselves and tripping over each other. Because Jesus becomes the way, the truth, and the life. The only way to the Father. And that's in our marriages, that's in our families, that's in our community, that's in our church. So, let me wrap this up, because I could go on forever. This leads to the last truth I want to share on submission. But it begs the question, who are you ultimately submitting to when we submit to each other and when wives submit to their husbands? Who are we ultimately submitting to? Jesus. Jesus. The last point is this. A spirit-filled follower of Jesus submits ultimately to Jesus. And we have to fight for that every day. Because you know you're always submitting to something. You're always submitting to something. You're submitting to the approval of other people. You're submitting to the influence of the culture. You're submitting to selfish gain, fleshly desires. Or you are submitting to Jesus. There's not both. It's one or the other. It's one or the other. And we're going to see that in just a second. But what I want to do is look at this in regards to what we've seen so far. Ephesians 5, 21 through 22. Where ultimately submitting to each other and wives submitting to their husbands is ultimately coming in order with Jesus. Jesus being in his rightful place. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. It is all about having Jesus in the rightful place of your relationships. 
It's all about prioritizing Jesus, having Jesus be in between you, but ultimately having Jesus on the throne of your heart. That's what submission means. Jesus in your rightful place in this relationship. Jesus, your rightful place in my marriage. Jesus, this rightful place in relationship to my family. Jesus, your rightful place in relationship to those who are mistreating me. Jesus, your rightful place in a world that is rejecting you. Jesus, in your rightful place on the throne of my heart. And this truth is revealed in Colossians 3.18 where it says, wives, submit to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. That word fitting actually carries this picture of being restored to a rightful place. Well, what's the rightful place under the authority of Jesus? What's the rightful place having Jesus on the throne of our heart? What's the rightful place? Loving your spouse by loving Jesus first. Loving your kids by loving Jesus first. Loving your parents by loving Jesus first. It is an order of priority and love. And to me, it's wrapped up in actually the rebuke that Jesus gave to the church in Revelation 2-4, where he said, nevertheless, I have this against you, you have left your first love. You see, when we don't live with a heart of humility, when we don't live with a heart of valuing others above ourselves, when we don't live with a heart of submitting and coming underneath and lifting up our spouse, when we don't live in that way, we are forsaking our first love. Because when Jesus is our first love, we will grow in the mind of Christ that will value others above ourselves. When Jesus is our first love, we will see our spouse the way Jesus gave us the example by laying down our lives. When we see others through loving Jesus first, we will love them by lifting them up closer to him. Don't forsake your first love. Hupotasso, coming under to lift up so that ultimately we are submitting to Jesus and we are lifting them up closer to Jesus and we are positioning our heart so Jesus is first. Does this apply to today? Yes. Will this apply until Jesus comes back? Absolutely. Because this is what it means to be filled by the Spirit to follow the example of Jesus, to have the character of Christ, and to love Christ first, that we lift others up to him. And men, I want to see you next week because we're going to see how this applies to you. In one verse, we have such jam-packed what it means to be a sacrificial leader. And I'm telling you, I, I can't study it without, first of all, looking at myself and going, God, please do this in me. And so it is our pursuit of Christ that is manifested in how we love each other, submit, serve, and lift each other up closer to him. Amen? Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you for having your heart open to what God would speak today and in your bulletin, we have been having in this series some application questions. And so if you didn't get a bulletin, grab one on the way back. Because what those are for is for you throughout the week to be able to pull that out and just allow the Holy Spirit to take you deeper. Pray about that. There's some scripture to read in there. There's some questions to ask. And it's all about going deeper. Because if we are not changed by God's word, we are not submitting to God's word. If we are not changed in the likeness of Jesus, we are quenching the Holy Spirit. So let's go deeper. Do we all need to grow and change? Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to have an invitation song. Father God, thank you. God, I thank you for each one here. I, I just am overwhelmed with the love for them. I'm overwhelmed with, with just the desire you have to move and work in their life. 
And thank you, God, that you have called us to a home that is not this world. And thank you, God, you have called us up to a life that is different than this world. Because the ways of this world is empty. The ways of this world is shallow. The ways of this world leaves us longing and wanting more but never achieving it. So God, thank you, you have given us an identity, a value, a worth, a purpose that is only in Christ through the ministry and filling of your spirit that we can live. We can live for you. We can live with a purpose, an identity that does not leave us empty but fills us and draws us unto you where we get to the point where we want nothing but you and we hold on to you and everything we do in life comes back to that place of God I need you in this situation I need you more in this relationship God I need you to work on the issue of my heart do a heart surgery to deal with the sin of my heart so that it is Jesus that is left God, do that work in us. And God, we say, you are good and your love endures forever. Thank you. That's who you are. And God, thank you that it's all in Jesus Christ. Yeshua HaMashiach. In Jesus Christ's name, we pray. Amen.